God exalted him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. And I can see some of you mouthing those words with me, which is wonderful. Christ is King. His is King. And Jesus' kingdom was established by love and self-sacrifice, not by violence and force. And so we can trust him to reign in justice and mercy. So those are my two points about Jesus' kingdom. It is everlasting and it is established by his loving self-sacrifice. And somehow it's not a contradiction to talk about the establishment of an everlasting kingdom. Because our, as our readings have shown us, especially in Daniel 7, that, that vision of, of God on his throne in the ancient of days, God's throne has been from everlasting. And we know from scripture that Jesus is God and has been with God since the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Um, and yet, when Jesus came and he died and he rose again and he ascended into heaven, it seems like a new era of that kingdom was inaugurated. Um, I guess later on we'll say the words of our creed, right? And it says, he, Jesus, is seated, where? At the right hand of the Father. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, right now. He is king. He already has the authority. But what's the next line? And? He will come. Come on. He will come. come, on. He will come. Choose whether we're going to allow him to reign over our lives. It's an act of 
surrender to him. When we make that decision, he gives us his Holy Spirit to become more like him. He helps us in our weaknesses. We still fail, but slowly and tenderly, the Spirit works in us to make us more like Christ. And so paradoxically, whilst we have to leave behind certain aspects of ourselves, which are not fitting for his holy kingdom, the transformational work that God does inside of us actually helps us to be more like the person he truly created us to be. So that's one side, but another side of being a priest in God's kingdom is that priests were supposed to represent God to the people. In other words, when someone saw a priest, they were supposed to see God reflected. So what does that mean for us in our daily lives? It means that in everything we do, people should be able to see that we do not belong to this world. We are citizens of heaven. We are subject to the king who did not violently attack in order to establish his kingdom, but who laid his life down. It means that when someone does me wrong, the Holy Spirit can help me to respond in love as Christ did. And so people will see that I follow him rather than the ways of the world. It also means that whilst we take an interest in and we care about and we even grieve for the state of this present world and we should grieve for the sin <coughs> that we see, we don't despair. We do not despair because we know there is something greater. We hear the words of Jesus in John 16 echoing in our innermost being when he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He is greater. Christ is king. His dominion is everlasting. The double gap between that one. Okay. So lastly, we turn to the book of Revelation. And any of you here try to read the book of Revelation know that it's not the easiest one to search for. But here's the good news, and here's the main point of the book. You ready? Christ is king. Is king. That's it. Woo. Woo. <laughs> Revelation reminds us that there are forces of evil in the heavenly places. But don't ever be tempted to think that our enemies are human. It's so easy to fall into that trap, to make our fellow human beings the enemy. And we see the way that people are tarnished by sin and we think, what? He, she is the enemy. But the scripture clearly says, and I'm quoting from Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against human beings but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's the spiritual forces of evil who are working to stop anyone they can from knowing Christ the King. But you know what happens at the end of Revelation? Jesus has the final victory over those forces of evil. He wins. Christ is King. He's the King and fear, let us firstly remember that none of this is new in the course of historical events. We shouldn't be surprised at what is taking place. Rather, we have hope because we belong to Jesus' everlasting kingdom whose foundations are justice, love, mercy, self-sacrifice. We are citizens, priests, in his holy kingdom. And so we should intercede for these challenging situations and remember who our God is. He is enthroned above all. We don't have to fear. And let us remember that before being a citizen of any country, we are a citizen of heaven. Fear is not to reign in our hearts. That's where Jesus is to reign. Christ is King. His dominion is everlasting. And that makes all the difference. So to end, um, since we're going to take a 
a different focus of, in our in session time. Um, now, I'd like if you would just close your eyes and pray with me as we, as we commit our world to God. Father, we thank you that Jesus is King. We thank you that your rule is everlasting, that your dominion is from ages gone by and always will be, and that we have every hope and confidence, Lord. And God, I pray for our world as we look at all the, the wars, the difficulties, the political turmoil, and we just ask that you would come, that you would bring peace, but most of all, that you would allow your peace to reign in our hearts, Lord, and that we wouldn't fear because we know that you are bigger. And we also pray, Lord, that you would enable us to, in every moment of our life, remember that you are king and to live accordingly, that our actions would reflect your love and that people would see in us that we belong to you. We praise you for your greatness and we thank you that you came to earth and that you want to have a relationship with us. And we call out to you and ask that you would lead us and guide us in your truth. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.
of gender-based violence. Um, Mother's Union has a campaign which has been running for many years all around the world. There will be dubs in many, many Anglican churches all over the world. And the campaign is against gender-based violence. And it's called Rise Up. So the campaign officially begins tomorrow. Tomorrow is International, International Day Against uh, Gender-Based Violence. And it ends on December the 10th, which is International Human, Human Rights Day. So every year at this time, we're going to look at this question. We're going to focus on it. We're going to pray about it. So the Rise Up campaign means respond, inform, support, empower, unite, and pray. And yeah, that's, that's what I have to say. So now you know what that loves me. And De Debbie has a story to share with us. Thank you, Kiki. I want to tell you the story of a friend of mine. I could tell you another story about a man who suffered gender violence, but I'm going to tell you about a friend of mine, a female, a woman, who suffered gender violence. These are the facts. A husband who was both physically and verbally abusive, pregnant with her second child, and fearing for her life and for the life of her unborn child, as well as the first child, who was then three years old. She moved to a hostel for battered women in the city where her family lived. She was hidden for many years. She's not bumped into her former husband yet. She pulled herself together, finished her secondary school maths, moved into a council flat with her family, completed a degree in art and a teaching certificate, and she's now deputy head of the art department in a huge secondary school. Success, you might say. Success? But there's a backstory. When I spoke with her and asked her permission to share this with you, and told her how courageous she'd been to do what she did, she said to me, tell them this. I could not have done what I did and leave like I left if I didn't know how loved I was. How loved I was by God and how loved I could be myself. How loved I could love myself because of God's love for me. She couldn't have done it, she said, without love, faith, and hope. She came from a loving Christian family that helped. She had that background to fall back on. And a family who received her after all that happened with no judgment because she was leaving her husband. And of course the love she had for her children. <coughs> and the faith and hope that filled her with the expectation that life could be different. Christ is king. I didn't say that because Jenny was going to say that. That was in my notes. She could do what she did because she knew that Christ is king. His dominion is everlasting. I met her at the beginning of this story as a member of the church where I was curate nearly 20 years ago. I'm going to just quickly tell you two anecdotes. She couldn't afford a holiday, so every summer, the family of three would come with us in our car, we filled it up, 
to our home in France for a holiday. One day, when her son was seven, he was working with John in the garden and having a chat. John always made sure he didn't take a child away on his own anywhere. This was public space. They were having a chat. And for some reason, John said something about his wife. He didn't say Deborah, he said my wife. And this little boy said, who is your wife? John said, Deborah is my wife. And he said, oh, I thought she was your friend. <laughs> think about that. What did he think a husband was like after his experience as a little boy? Around the same time, I noticed from the front, you know we notice a lot from the front? When we're looking at you? I noticed from the front that one of the fathers in the church never married, but bringing his two children to church, in fact, I, my first baptism was of his little girl, really liked her. Hmm. I was very taken aback seeing this from the front, and I prayed, oh no, Lord, not yet. It was far too soon. This was just after she left. And she wasn't even divorced yet. She couldn't face perhaps seeing him in the process of divorce. He said nothing for eight years until her divorce was through. Eight years of patience. And then they got together. And not long after John and I came here, I went to their wedding. And now they have five children. Two of hers, two of his, and one of theirs. We had a lovely chat the other night. And John went off because it was going on forever. <laughs> it's a story full of love. And John likes to say, and I agree with him, that our problem is not with not praying enough, but with not loving enough. When we really love someone, we will pray fervently for them. So I leave that thought with you. We have a God whose kingdom is a kingdom of love. Christ is king. His dominion is everlasting. Thank you. Peace to you from God, who is our Father. Peace from Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, who gives us life. The peace of the triune God be always with you. And also with you that are shared with one another.
praise my soul, the King of Heaven, and the words are on the screen.
end of supper, gave him a cup of wine, and he gave you thanks. And said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that these gifts of your creation may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. And as we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ, and build us into a living temple to your glory. And bring us at the last with all the saints to the vision of that eternal splendor for which you have created us through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom, and in whom, with all who stand before you in heaven, we worship your Father Almighty in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing, Blessing and honor, and glory, and honor, be yours. Savior taught us, so we sing.
by the tea table, just with the names of everyone that said to me that they're happy to help with tea. So I'm not going to make that a promoter, but whenever you want to do it, if you just sign, like it's all data, so if you just put like a little tip by your name, and then just hope you got some sort of promoter for the tea. Um, but thank you to everyone that came to say that they help out. And um, thanks for everyone that does in the morning as well, because I don't know who you are, but if you want to put your name on the list too, <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.